Okay, so I think we'll just go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the final, final, final uh, day of Taka Art Summit 2018 and the very f last panel uh, as part of the um, speaking events programs for um, the summit. And my name is John Tain. I am your moderator today, and I'm also head of research at the Asia Art Archive. And uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome um, the four guests uh, who will be speaking about various um, biennials um, in South Asia. And um, before uh, I introduce them, I thought maybe what I would do is just kind of um, s say a little about why it is that we're here to talk about um, these recent recurring exhibitions. And um, maybe what we can do is go to the first slide, if you don't mind. Oh, okay, so actually I don't know, I think you're probably not able to see any of this, so sorry. Um, but um, what this is, this is, is actually um, a list of biennials, beginning with the Venice Biennale up on the left. And the highlighted yellow ones uh, are um, biennials that have been founded in um, various parts of Asia. Um, so really you can't make out any of it. But for instance, there's the Triennale in India, th which was founded in 1968, and then the Jakarta uh, Biennial in 19, uh, Biennale in 1968 as well. And then the next one you see is the Asian Art Biennial, uh, Biennial in 1981. So that's the one that's here in Dhaka and that you can see a history of downstairs as part of the exhibition. Um, and what you can see is that there's a certain kind of um, momentum that gathers in the 1980s um, and the early 90s, and then it kind of accelerates. So on that side of the screen is really the 1990s, and you can see a kind of proliferation of um, biennials uh, in Asia uh, beginning in the 1990s. And then can we have the next screen, please? And then this is followed by the 2000s, and more or less there's um, one a year that gets founded, on the, according to this list anyway, which is taken from the Global Contemporary um, which was an exhibition and publication that came out of the ZKM in Germany. Um, and as um, you'll be hearing, the kind of there's an acceleration that be begins in the late 2000s. Um, so with various um, exhibitions, including the uh, Colombo Art Biennial uh, that is in 2009. Um, and uh, the Dhaka Art Summit, of course, begins in 2012 as well. Um, and part of why I bring this up is to kind of just situate the Dhaka Art Summit and the exhibitions that you'll be hearing about within this larger context and this larger movement, um, which is, indicates a kind of an evolution or shift in the way that most people or many people experience contemporary art. Um, in other words, you know, if we normally think of art as something that gets experienced within the gallery space or the mu museum space, the space of the biennial or the recurring exhibition creates a different kind of context for understanding this work, and it's an important context for understanding this work because I think it's not, a, like the gallery or the museum, it's not a neutral context, but one that has a very specific charge and valence attached to it. Um, and especially, I think, when we think of this most recent wave of biennials that have been um, founded uh, since beginning in the late uh, teen or early years of the 2000s, I guess, um, especially since these art biennials are often positioned um, in some kind of context relationship with the art fair, right? This is also a moment when we have the kind of the rise of the art fair as a kind of a, as a replacement of the gallery system. And so one of the things that we can kind of think about is what is the meaning of these biennials? What is the context that these biennials offer? And how, does, how do we think about it in comparison or a contrast with the art fair context, right? Um, and, you know, just to say a little about my own kind of um, position in all of this, maybe we can go one more for ahead. Um, as a member of the Asia Art Archive, an organization that itself was founded in the early 2000s, so more or less contemporary with the rise of these Asian biennials and the rise of contemporary art in Asia, um, the question of the biennial is a very important one because it is in a very important um, um, 
occurs at a moment of transition in uh, the history of art in Asia, but also it offers a very, very unique way of thinking about this rise. And um, there's been a lot of scholarship, both done by people who were working with Asia Art Archive and elsewhere. And um, today, I think part of the point of the panel is to present um, uh, the thoughts of four um, people working in the field, as it were, critics and um, people who are really kind of um, on the ground, and how in some ways what they're doing can be thought of as kind of um, really um, offering the first wave of scholarship for thinking about this work. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers in the order in which they'll be speaking. So first we'll have uh, Mustafa Zaman, uh, who was born in 1968. He was trained as a printmaker, but soon began to traverse a wide gamut of contemporary concepts and mediums, often veering towards composite multidisciplinary presentations. Since the late 1990s, he has contributed art reviews to The Observer magazine, the vernacular daily um, um, Proto Malo, and the Daily Star. From 2002 to 2005, he was a feature writer working for the Star Weekend magazine, a supplement of the Daily Star, regularly contributing on art, uh, literature, and politics. Mustafa was editor of Depart, which focuses uh, on contemporary art from South Asia, with special emphasis on Bangladesh for the last seven years, and now divides his time between his art, art writing, and teaching. Next, we have Jyoti Dar, who is uh, an art critic of British and Indian descent, currently based in Colombo. She is a contributing editor for Art Asia Pacific and, has regularly, and regularly contributes to Art Forum in the Sunday Times in Sri Lanka. She is the recipient of the Forbes India Emerging Art Writer of the Year Award 2014 and first prize at the International Awards for Art Criticism uh, for in 2017. Her writing has appeared in Aperture, Art Asia Pacific, Art Forum, Asian Art News, Contemporary Practices, even Flash Art, Harper's Bazaar, or, uh, Harper's Bazaar Art Arabia, uh, East Kutzvo uh, Arts M Journal, Modern Painters, Motherland, and the Sunday Times in Sri Lanka. Um, third, we have um, uh, Ratan Johal, uh, who is a PhD candidate in art history at Columbia University, working on transformations in contemporary art practice and its institutional context and networks during the 1990s, uh, with a focus on India. During the past two years, he was a CMAP fellow for Asia in the Department of Media and Performance uh, Art at MoMA and a Hel uh, Helena Rubenstein Critical Studies Fellow at the Whitney Independent Study Program. Ratan has previously worked with various, um, in various capacities, including curator, archivist, and publications editor at Koj International Artists Association in New Delhi. Um, finally, last, last but not least, we have Kirchi Dasgupta, who is an Indian artist and art critic currently based in Kathmandu, Nepal. She has held solo shows in Nepal and UK and participated in a number of group shows, including biennales and art fairs. Her writings on contemporary South Asian art has appeared in publications like Freeze, Depart, Asian Art News, and others. She has spoken on the subject of, uh, on international panels. She was inducted into ICA in 2016 and began curating a series of pan-South Asian shows, uh, Things Lost Remembering the Future, 2017, uh, with new editions coming up soon, and was awarded the ACC Weimar. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, sh do you want me to finish? Okay, um, so on that note, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, Mustafa who is going to be Thank speaking about Asian, Asian uh, art by Yanali. Can, can I have my slides, please? Yeah. So it's, it's, it gives um, uh, reason to be nostalgic because I grew up uh, looking at you know, the first few editions. Of when I was in school, back in 1981, I was in school, so um, it gives you ground for, I feel a bit nostalgic. So uh, the, oh, oldest running Biennale of Asia. Uh, it started with the first edition, which was a stage in 1981. Asian Biennale initially behaved like a, I mean, if, if you look at it as a beast, it behaved like uh, any other canonical space where national pride and the idea of progress intersected. So artists and cognoscenti 
were equally enthused by having this particular show brought to uh, Dhaka. The idea came from uh, the then director of uh, <coughs> Charukala, which is fine art in uh, <coughs> English. Uh, Shilpakala Academy was behind this particular uh, I mean, they organized this, they planned it, and they executed it. Uh, and uh, the man behind this particular beast was uh, Sayyid Jahangir, the artist and uh, director of Charukala. Charukala is fine art, as I said. And uh, we were very much enthused because uh, we were school-going children back then. I was in, probably in class nine, and was planning to become an artist. Uh, and as a, as a space, I would say, uh, uh, we looked at it as a desiring space, also a space for, of course, it became the space for competing stereotypes of Bangladeshi art, space to dramatize, glorify the competences of Bangladeshi artists, as well as their creative prowess, to display their creative prowess. Next slide, please. So we are looking at the first, the very first uh, uh, catalog that came out in 1981 and uh, these are like archives because I've, I've looked for information in, in the office in today's office here in this edifice but you won't be able to find anything other than these uh, catalogs so they are our archives so next slide please we had little understanding of what was modern and what was contemporary back then. So, uh, because Dhaka was then Dhaka, as you can see. So it started in Dhaka and then later on it continued. In the collective imaginary, collective imaginary Asian Art Biennale became an important site of mystification, as I said, glorification of art and artist. Still, this was and still is the very site where new cultural traffic surfaced and still surfaces surface and uh, and the contemporary the very concept of contemporary sort of uh, burst into uh, view in this particular site so works that quoted bewilderment and even outrage uh, back in the 80s back in the early 80s i would say uh, came from japan japan was heavily involved in the sense that japan foundation became involved with the, with the staging of the very uh, uh, Biennale that we had. We used to call our own. So there were other people. So it was a part of a, a, a bigger s growing network. Uh, not all artists uh, considered it a, it a terrain full of unfamiliar visuals because people started to veer away from artists especially, started to veer away from uh, traditional modernist paintings uh, medium specific form specific paintings and uh, sculptures uh, back in the uh, 70s late 70s and we have here Kalidash Kormakar who was one of the pioneers who sort of be veered into uh, new stratagems and ideas and themes that um, started to pour in to that uh, start to appear in the art scene um, uh, I mean, the artists who were behind that did realize that this is the very moment that would, would be able to uh, uh, exploit it. Uh, and this is the very site where we'd be able to uh, stage our own art, strategies that had nothing to do with um, tradition, traditional modernity uh, in that sense. Uh, it's certainly, um, I mean, appearance of this particular space, exhibition space, um, uh, was part and parcel of this idea of a new era that dawned on, on, on Dhaka and also uh, this, this particular country which used to be uh, referred to as a backwater um, in terms of, the, of, of its economic condition. Although the economy was thriving, uh, art scene was, was rather bleak. It seemed bleak to us, those who were looking for many, many uh, ways to stage our own art, own new kinds of art, and uh, uh, the opportunity, the web, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to look at the web was few and far between back then in, in the 80s for people like us, for uh, youngsters who were growing up in the 80s. And uh, uh, 
that it resided in a in a in a in, a, in an intersection between uh, the old uh, modernist guard and the avant-garde, the people who w wanted to veer away from uh, modernist uh, medium-specific and form-specific practices. Uh, it was an important um, uh, site for the uh, for the appearance of the contemporary. Next slide, please. So Bangladesh Shilpukala Academy, a key government institution dedicated to promoting art and culture, was once extra cautious in accepting the new forms of practice in its national level exhibitions. So we need to um, put it in context that we were unable, as artists, we were unable to uh, submit um, our own work in, in, in the conventional spaces. So Asian Art Biennale was the first un unconventional space, a kind of piece that would um, consume everything, everything from modern to contemporary, um, and something which is which came out of the blue. I mean, if it, if it is looked at uh, today from the point of view of, of yesteryears. So it was a sign of transgression since the beginning. And as the installation art from Japan uh, began to pour in, Deshi artists gradually mustered the courage to stage their own cross-media works. Uh, so there's this ambivalency. I'm, I'm referring to this ambivalency towards this new media and many other uh, forms of practice here. So that ambivalency existed back in the 80s and still uh, seemed to haunt us uh, today. Next slide, please. So we have here, um, this is right out of the, uh, uh, the second book, the second catalog, uh, the catalog of the sec uh, second edition. Uh, it's a history in the making. I'm, I'm, as, a, as the consecrated space of modernism, the Asian Art Biennale, uh, sought to pacify at once artists attached to academic realism and those who were into experimentation. Nationalist signifiers and international idioms thus began to share space, swap features, and also became subject of contest, contested attention. So <clears throat> it is more than an exhibition. It was an ecology where all things commingled. <clears throat> Next slide, please. As a hold all, I, I call it a hold all carry all exhibition space. The Asian Art Biennale was at first inclusive of all kinds of art, traversing traditional to modern to contemporary languages and tendencies. As you can see, uh, this, this is um, from North Korea, a North Korean painting, painting by a Korean artist exemplifying the academic tradition specific to Korea. So that is the kind of realism that we had to encounter um, in, in the first few editions of the Biennale. Next slide. If the Chinese traditional landscape art and Arab and ir Iranian calligraphic works were featured throughout the 1980s, the drift uh, began to change in the late 1990s. Simultaneously, works from the countries of oceanic region and the Americas began to add value to the expanding corpuses or the expanding ecology, I would say, positively contributing to the changing patterns of e exhibits. New media slowly crept into the site, though in the academic realm, it still has no place in the curriculum. So there's this bifurcation through which you'd be able to talk about Bangladeshi art and how Bangladeshi art mm, were being staged and are being staged, is being staged and was being staged uh, back then in the 80s and, and also it continued to, to be staged in the 90s onward. Next slide. The bifurcation I was talking about has to do with whether to uh, go for strategies that are not modernist, like whether it is, it doesn't matter whether it is postmodern or post postmodern, but there are strategies which are not medium specific. There are strategies which are not um, uh, uh, taught in the in the academia. So these are the are the. Uh, this is one of the examples of what we encountered in the uh, second exhibition, the second edition of, of um, uh, <coughs> the um, Asian Art Biennale. So dispersed across the. Uh, three venues, Asian Art Biennale, gripped the imagination of Dhaka is because of its size and ambition. So it had a huge ego, a huge um, uh, ambition. The size of the ambition was huge. 
the painting remained a staple throughout because still two dimensional uh, works are, are, are defines the entire um, art scene today in Bangladesh. Although um, installation and all sorts of other stratagems sort of appeared uh, gradually in that particular space. In the second edition, uh, installation was introduced, um, provide, and which provided a counterpoise to what was conventional and predictable. Next, pl next slide. The site presented works from a Japanese artist whose installations were memorable and also edifying to artists who were looking to break away from the dominant patterns of practices. And the dominant patterns was uh, tied to medium specificity and form specificity, which is beholden to uh, European uh, education and also avant-garde, European avant-garde practices. So Bangladesh mainstream was sort of, def you would be able to define Bangladesh mainstream in relation to uh, medium specific trends that you see uh, in the art scene, which is the ruling spirit. Next slide. So the Biennale was the first interface that has successfully breached the art scene of Japan, Korea, and many other Far Eastern, as well as, as uh, <coughs> Middle Eastern countries with that of Bangladesh. Next slide. Gradually, when, when installation art and new media art, homegrown new media art uh, was accepted in the uh, Biennale, the emerging artist found this exhibition space to be an ideal site for planning big, going overboard with experimentation, with process, mediums, in terms of process, mediums, and thematics. So these are artists who sort of cultivated on their own strategies that they haven't learned at the academy. Because um, as I said earlier, the curriculum that, that are, uh, curric curricula that are followed in the academias are still um, worn out curriculas. They are, uh, we, are, we are carrying the uh, colonial legacy to this day. Though the academic links, <coughs> academic, academies are linked with uh, AAB in an obvious way because the pedagogical um, uh, influence is still there because uh, as you go through the, uh, the, uh, the site, you'd be able to find so many medium specific art to this day and even if it isn't me only medium specific, the experimentation never goes beyond this particular uh, parameter of uh, academic art. So there are uh, installations that would um, give you an idea that, that uh, the artist is um, still exploring the parameters uh, that are not beyond within that particular practice of academia, like live drawing and uh, the representational techniques that we learn at the academies. Next slide. So after an organized effort by artists like Mahabub Rahman and, and his friends and um, other artists who pushed for incorporation of Bangladesh installation in the, uh, around the late and mid 1990s, uh, finally uh, the decision was changed on the part of the, because as we, as we can see installation art is very, very visible in, in uh, in, the, in the site, but they came from the outside world. Nothing homegrown um, was displayed back then in the 80s. So 90s sort of changed that because submission was, uh, was accepted, submission of installation and spaces were allocated for separate space uh, was allocated for installation art. By the new millennium, artists who spearheaded the installation art movement have already uh, already been showcased in the Biennale. The Biennale started accommodating the emerging languages, I, I would say. So, next slide. So th this is just an example of, uh, of you know, how artists started to veering away from the convention of painting or medium specificity, I would say. So, next slide. So this became one of the most important international, uh, I mean, the important intersection where you'd be able to uh, look at 
art uh, by people who are internationally mobile. Next slide. So this is my last slide. After 40 years of ex in existence, uh, as non-descript site, I would, I would call it a, define it as a non-descript site, it is now in need of a curatorial framework. It is still don't have any curator. Curators are not engaged in, in devising, planning uh, this particular exhibition. So as the last remaining uncurated exhibition in Asia, it is still focused on countries rather than artists. Thank you very much. Hi, do you want to put the presentation on? Um, I want to first thank you, John, and thank you, Diana, and thank you all for staying for the really last talk of the summit. Um, I'm going to be talking about two of Sri Lanka's major art festivals, which have had nine editions over the last eight years, so please bear with me. Um, I'm going to try and split them up into three different phases so that we can kind of understand it a, a little in a broader spectrum. The first phase is when they launched as relatively radical and experimental events um, at the height of the post-conflict kind of situation. The second is where they begin to expand and amplify, but in doing so, they really begin to become quite split events. And the third is when they begin to sort of project forward to the future, but in doing so, they begin to sort of lose their footing and perhaps their relevance. Um, but first, a report about a report uh, to help set the scene. Um, so on the 14th of May 2000, two young Colombo-based journalists, Rouhani Pereira and Leila Nasri, published a story in the Sunday Times called Attention or at Ease. It was meant to be a straightforward survey about how the youth in the capital felt about the latest round of wartime curfews and social restrictions. But to their surprise, it had to be sent to the Ministry of Information, along with every other article on the war, to be reviewed and redacted. Those who worked at the national newspapers in the 1990s in Sri Lanka tell us that at various points in time, this was actually regular procedure. And not only that, but the editors chose to print their publications with the censored bits or the blacked out bits included, which I think is amazing. Um, next slide. The years that followed, and in particular 2005 to 2015, which is when these editions actually were launched, um, are said to have been some of the worst for press censorship in Sri Lanka. In a recent article on the alternative media site Groundviews, journalist Daisy Pereira discusses the systemic application of pain inflicted on the media in Sri Lanka during this time. Now, what I think is interesting about evoking the notion of pain is that like repression, it's most often invisible. Both chronic pain and chronic repression also share the common side effect of shrinking one's sense of self. The decision to print these stories with their blacked out areas included, that's actually Rouhani Pereira's story at the top, um, was a pushing back against this shrinkage. It was a way of making the censorship visible. Um, it was a small tale of defiance, if you will. This poignant image of control serves as a visual reminder, especially today um, in a post-2015 relatively open kind of space that we're in, um, in Sri Lanka, that have long been employed to circumvent feeling silenced um, and of the extended climate of constraint and sometimes fear that many contemporary art exhibitions in Sri Lanka have taken place. Uh, next slide, please. Artists, though they were not often the main targets of state surveillance unless they were activists too, did have to do things such as band together, practice in safe spaces, self-spencer, or go underground. At the same time, several art exhibitions of provocative and political work did take place in public places, such as the, uh, the National Art Gallery, Jaffna Library, Lionel Went Gallery. So the reason for me telling you this is that it was a really varied, active, um, historical kind of context. And neither were the artistic responses to this time of war and post-war homogenous, and neither is there really a clear line between war and post-war. In fact, the first Columba Biennale was conceived during the height of the war at, in February 2009, but staged just four months after the conflict came to a violent and bloody end. Next slide, please. Uh, the artist and co-founder Jagat Veera Singer's choice to title the exhibition Imagining Peace in the most acute and chaotic stage of the conflict was in a sense speculative, but it was also highly subversive. Um, 
what is interesting about this exhibition is that it was really collaborative. You had six of Colombo's key cultural practitioners each curate a pavilion and work together really for the first and a lot of the times, in a lot of cases, the last time. Um, this is actually Saskia uh, Fernando's pavilion where she curated Jagat Ravindra's work, um, which was of sculptural heads and surrounded by scores of bullets. And the Ground Views editor, Sanjana, actually wrote a poem to, to go with this. Uh, next slide, please. Nearly three years on, Anushka Hempel decided to mount the next iteration of the Biennale. Um, and for this, artist and activist Chandragupta Thenuwara created the controversial series of works. Um, this is not a white flag, which you can see in Shalmini's show downstairs, actually. Um, and although this was looking at kind of questioning what the idea of what is this piece that we've got, it was also actually alluding to the fact that a lot of people were said to have been waving white flags in the final um, stage of the conflict. So it was a really gutsy, controversial thing to say, and the talks panel that year, which were launched, were said to be very gutsy. On the other hand, you also had a member of the audience asking, well, why haven't we got any um, artwork celebrating the end of the war? Next slide, please. So it was a really kind of challenging post-conflict questions basically were beginning to crop up. Um, and yet there was a lack of public fora. That year the Gaul Litfrest, which, which is another site for public discussion, was cancelled. So in its place, Columbuscope was, was mounted as a place for um, public expression. Its inaugural um, edition was called Identities, and it had literary, film, and art components to it. Um, so Rohani Pereira, who's now a theatre practitioner, um, her emotive performance installation, Absence, looked at the trauma and displacement of um, women during the war, and an earlier iteration of that can actually also see, be seen in Sharmini's show downstairs. At its core, though, what you can see, this really interesting image is of... Um, members from the media and Sri Lankan army coming together and the talk was called Who Counted the Bodies? So they were asking really critical counter kind of counter information if you will sort of coming out um, and some people suggest that this was maybe the most radical edition because it had no sponsors. Um, next slide please. In comparison, by this stage, the Columba Biennale was working towards its third iteration. It was registered as a private company, and it was looking to other sponsors to really build and expand its platform. Um, for their 2014 outings, the Biennale and Columbuscope chose to club together and have the same theme, which was called Making Histories. Um, but they ended up being completely disparate events. Um, so the Biennale aimed to showcase younger artists and um, perhaps in a response to the previous edition being called the Tirtanali. Um, but it ended up, due to a number of logistic and funding issues, being a really sort of cobbled together show with very little depth or focus. Um, of course, there were individual exceptions, like ha uh, Radhika Hetarchi's um, archival project, which mapped the stories of Sri Lanka mothers in the north, south, and east of Sri Lanka. And that's actually now in the National Archives. Uh, next slide, please. Hetiarachi also curated Columbuscope that year, which she described as a think festival of film, music, and uninhibited discussions. Um, there were also memory walks with historians, and the talks took place in these really incredible spaces like the Whist Bungalow, Old Town Hall, the Grand Oriental Hotel. So it was really taking the Colombo art-going crowd completely out of their comfort zone. And it was really set the tone for Columbuscope being about reclaiming histories and spaces. Um, Pariah, which was, there's a sort of still of, of the play there, it was an interactive play where you had to follow the actors through um, the Rio Hotel, which had been partly burnt down in the 1983 riots. And it was about, it was critiquing state oppression, so it was, it, you know, um, it was really loved, that play. Uh, next slide, please. After seeing Pariah, um, co-curators Natasha Ginwala and Menika van der Porten chose to mount the following edition of, of Columbuscope at the Rio Cinema and Hotel, which was, as I said, a site not just associated with that 1983 riots, but it had huge current complexities because the area that was in is actually being, a lot of the communities are being turfed out because of uh, the Colombo Port City and other developments. Its curatorial strength of this, the, of this exhibition was that it had very contextually sensitive kind of works and it invited um, artists from Jaffna and Colombo to come and produce beautiful kind of works um, and it was really very engaging and sensitive. 
It's also important to remember that this edition was set against a renewed sense of optimism in the city because it was six months since the new government had come into power and there were several palpable shifts taking place in the city. Practitioners were now starting to think about the idea of what form and truth and rec uh, reconciliation might take. Uh, next slide, please. An expanded Columbus scope at this point, also under new sponsorship, decided to also look forward. So what's Columbo going to be doing now? Um, and had a theme of art and digital culture in Europe and South Asia, which is huge. So what, what happened was that they looked to get an international curator, which they did, but they couldn't find a local counterpart. And in the end, the exhibition, unfortunately, um, the curator couldn't find works to fit, fit what she sort of wanted to test out to do, and it ended up almost being a kind of very Eurocentric exercise in pedagogy, which really only alienated um, local artists. It wasn't really connected to local realities at all. It was staged in the general post office, though, which hadn't been used um, since the 1997 bomb attack, so the venue was incredible. But the art exhibits really sort of took prominence over what were now just supplementary talks, and um, similar issues were beginning to really plague the Biennale as well, of the underlying structure of the festival. And some curators, at this point, local curators, beginning to distance themselves from these events due to a lack of clarity and, and direction. Um, next slide, please. Nevertheless, Conceiving Space, which was the next edition of the Biennale, curated by Al Mitha, was its largest and most even rendering to date, um, with some engaging site-specific installations like this, Rajni Pereira's um, work, a long arm, a tight grip, which was in the old town hall. Where it did take a wrong turn, unfortunately, was with its architecture and community component, and in particular, the great feast, which you can see a little image of here, um, along Dispensary Lane, which saw, in, it, it was problematic because of its framing of, and its insensitivity toward local culture, um, and it saw sort of local residents and a catering company providing food to Colombo's art-going crowd along a long street in, in Slave Island. Um, so it's fair to say that somewhere in their drive to be bigger and better, these festivals had lost their charge and to a certain extent their way. Um, next slide, please. Now we don't know what we're reacting to, is what Menica van der Poorten said uh, recently, who curated the, least, uh, the most recent iteration of Columbus Scope which was staged um, in, a, again, a beautiful site, the old Terminus railway station, but and, and aimed to engage with environmental issues. But it was also hastily put together and had various kind of sponsorship issues, resulting in a really hasty assortment of works, which ended up, unfortunately, looking more like a, a science exhibition at points. Um, next slide, please. So o overall, in, in summary, if we look at these latest editions, I mean, people really started to question at this point who these events were really for, including the founders, uh, like Jagat Virasinga recently said the same to me, um, how they were curated and put together, and what their relevance really truly is now. Um, while the Biennale and Columbus Scope have certainly provided frameworks for visibility, it has to be noted that the most interesting art practice still takes place outside of these institutions in informal spaces as well as smaller scale exhibitions throughout the year. These are just two shows that I went to last week. One was a pop-up show in a modernist's home at the Supplemal Foundation, and one was an informal gathering, well, an opening really, of the Mulligama Art Center an hour away from Colombo, and they were absolutely brilliant. Um, next slide, please. So one such recent exhibition, at, um, which was talking about post-conflict um, kind of concerns, it was said that as Sri Lanka approaches 10 years since the war and 70 years uh, since independence, the need for acknowledgement and accountability is still critical. Otherwise, the country will, at one way or another, always be at war with itself. Historically, one of the key ways in which this has been done in Sri Lanka is through media and the arts. And for this reason, more than any, it's crucial that these alternative but flawed spaces for expression continue to maybe rethink, reshape, recalibrate, but definitely continue to grow and sprout and maybe into different forms. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd also like to start by thanking the organizers of the summit, Diana and my fellow panelists, um, but in the same breath to acknowledge the fact that um, I'm a bit of a tokenistic presence here on account of another 
scholar um, Gayatri Sena who was supposed to be speaking and so I apologize in advance for um, a presentation that's been prepared just this afternoon um, but I will attempt to address um, in this context of exhibition histories um, and frameworks the Kochi Mutsiris Biennale which many of you may be familiar with um, and here as you see on the screen um, this Biennale was um, promoted and continues to be known widely as India's first Biennale, um, taking place in December, opening in December 2012. Um, and it, you know, that sort of um, rhetoric and discourse around it being the first Biennale, I think, deserves to be examined further, but also um, to be, to, to, to consider um, the histories that um, it sort of positioning itself in line with, but also in some ways um, uh, concealing, um, and some of those histories might be um, more recently that of the Delhi Biennale, which was not an exhibition that actually took place, but a series of discussions around the possibility of a platform, uh, a Biennale platform during the 1990s. Um, and of course, further back, the Triennale India, which has been mentioned earlier by John, but also um, I think Nancy's here, who's um, written about that exhibition launched in 1968 and, and the kind of vision and ideas behind it and where those went um, over the course of the, the few decades following. Um, and so um, I, I thought maybe it'd be a good idea to look at, if we look at the next slide, um, the mission statement of the Kochi Biennale Foundation, um, and this is just an excerpt from it, um, but I've tried to sort of um, gather the core ideas, um, to say that it was first set up as a foundation in 2010 with the idea of having this platform. Um, and it was set up by two Mumbai-based artists of Malayali origin, um, both Krishnamachari and Riaz Komu. Um, and the idea of cosmopolitanism, which is a word that is evoked repeatedly, um, is, is something that is, you know, lives through um, all of the rhetoric that the Biennale Foundation puts out um, in terms of its um, its spirit, the reason for its existence, and the choice of site, the place where it's located, Kochi. Um, and, and here as well as you see some phrases um, to invoke the latent cosmopolitan spirit of the modern metropolis of Kochi and its mythical past. And I think here it's, you know, for those who are not familiar with the, the, the origin of the, of the term Kochi Mutsiris, which is a kind of hyphenated um, term that they have consciously come up with for this, it is to sort of talk about the the relation between the sort of present lived um, experience of Kochi as um, the city in, in South India, but also of um, the mythical past of Mutsiris, which is um, an ancient port city um, that is thought to have flourished between the 1st and 6th, 7th century AD, and then suddenly vanishes off the map literally. So, um, you know, that, uh, in channeling those two, those two histories, um, what they seek to do is create a, what they call a new language of cosmopolitanism um, and modernity. And, um, and lastly, I think what's interesting in, in, the, uh, in the third paragraph is this idea of drawing on the rich tradition of public action and engagement in Kerala. And um, this, another um, sort of phrase, the people's biennale, is something that, um, that has been very much attached with the Kochi Biennale from its very inception. Um, and this refers to a few different things. Um, firstly, of course, a kind of enduring tradition of the left in the state of Kerala, one of the last bastions in, in India of that. Um, of a kind of mainstream political presence of the left, and um, but also to this idea of a kind of public ownership, awareness, and celebration of this exhibition um, as something that um, that every Kochi resident and people who live in that um, in that area um, are very aware of and and are very engaged with in different ways, um, and this perhaps is 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 sharply in contrast with initiatives like this in other parts of the world where um, there are 
a group, a, there is a small group of people that gets together to create a platform like this, but the kind of broader public awareness um, isn't quite the same as it is in Kochi. Um, but it, this could also be seen to kind of take up this idea, the, the kind of problem of publics that, that um, Tapati Guha Takurta talks about, um, referring to the case of Hussain and Chandra Mohan and these kinds of controversies that have happened in the past couple of decades, um, and, and to bridge that very, very large gap between these kinds of elite enclaves of culture and um, the, the, the kinds of access and training and pedagogy and experiences in relative to art that are offered to, to citizens. Um, and so we'll move to the next slide. Um, the first edition of the Biennale opened, in, as I said, um, on 12-12-12, um, that fateful date, and um, the, the the two curate the two founders of the of the foundation were actually the curators of the first edition as well, um, and I think the idea of an artist run biennale sort of started from there from the foundation um, into the first edition, and that has sort of been a legacy of that first edition, I would say, in that the Kochi Biennale has remained an artist-curated Biennale. And in that respect, I think it also deserves to be looked at um, within the, the trajectory of artist-run initiatives, um, both in India, but also in South Asia, and specifically in India, of course, this ranges back you know, to um, artist groups like Group 1890 or the Radical Painters and Sculptors Association that who are better known as the Kerala Radicals, um, but also to organizations such as Sahamath, Open Circle, Khoj, um, that kind of play an important role in, in establishing and nourishing a platform for artists to come together during the 80s and 90s. Um, and, you know, once again, the just to have a very brief quote from the curatorial note for the first edition, they say the Kochi Mazuris Biennale explores the possibilities of blurring the boundaries in a geographical region where boundaries are blurred in a local and cosmopolitan way, where the surroundings offer inspiration by way of the character of the place one can exhibit in. So um, to look at maybe the relationship between the, the foundation's mission but and the, the curatorial ambit for the first show where um, again, those ideas of the history of Kochi Mutsiris, um, this composite entity, um, and the surroundings, which I'll talk about in just a minute, uh, the actual venue for the Biennale, the primary venue for the Biennale, it is a, it's held over a series of venues, um, become the kind of site imaginary, the, 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 the way in which artists are invited to engage with um, with the curatorial uh, concept. And here we have uh, you know, what some of these iconic works from the first edition, Vivan Sundaram's um, Black Gold, which actually uses pottery shards um, from the, sorry, the previous slide, pottery shards from the archeological dig, digs around Patanam, uh, the mysterious site, um, to create the city. If we just look at the previous site. Thank you. Um, and and at the end of the Biennale, this, this is uh, flooded in, in the kind of gesture that mimics what is thought to have happened to um, the ancient city of Mutsiris. And then if we go ahead, um, one slide, thank you. Um, this is at the facade of Aspenwall House, which is the primary venue of the Biennale, which is um, formerly the headquarters of Aspenwall and Company, an English trading company that um, traded in all kinds of spices um, and, and goods from that region, including coconut, oil, tea, um, or, uh, and turmeric, spices, etc. So, I mean, those, um, and if we go to the next slide, I'm just sort of giving a sense of the kinds of projects that emerge in that first edition. Um, this is Sheila Gaura and Christopher Stowe's um, stopover, which is, in fact, if you, the view that was taken, the last image was taken just from that pier looking back at the building. So you get a sense of this jetty going out um, with these grinding stones that, sh um, that they've collected in Bangalore where um, these would be built into every traditional kitchen um, to grind spices and, and as much of Bangalore is being transformed, um, they, they, these are being discarded literally on the street side. They're almost too heavy to carry away, so they're just left where they were. 
Um, and so for them, they've sort of strewn these um, leading out to the water. And of course, this image as well that's just circular. I mean, I've just ripped this off of the internet. I didn't have my images with me. Uh, but it's become a kind of iconic image of that um, edition and perhaps of the, the concept of this Biennale. Um, and then if we go um, forward, I think, you know, since this is about writing histories and perhaps our job in the present as we are observing these exhibitions um, to also think about the things that um, we encounter but don't necessarily document and how um, those, you know, li will live on f future historians when they look back at the kinds of debates that happen around these um, these exhibitions. And here, I mean, you just have, this is again, images actually that I took that I did find um, from the first edition um, where the Biennale has been, um, of course, opposed by a certain group of people for on, on various accounts, on accounts of transparency, financial transparency and funding issues, um, on accounts of inclusion of local artists. Um, so these were posters in Malayalam that were plastered all over town during the first Biennale. And, and on the right, you see something, and this I think Jyoti can also speak to because we actually went to the first edition together, um, that all of us did show up on 12, 12, 12, um, but many of the artworks um, were not yet up. Um, and so this is actually where Ranbir Kalika's installation was to be, and you see the work has begun, but I think this was taken on December 13th or 14th. And of course, over the course of the opening week, most things did go up, but also that the energy leading up to the Biennale and all of the sort of um, discourse around it, and then of course landing up there and realizing that there were issues and constraints from labor union problems to availabilities of projectors to enough people to actually be part of installation teams that. Um, that made this an exhibition that was quite difficult to realize. Um, and of course, if we go to the next slide, I mean, I'm just gonna show you the next edition's um, curatorial statement. The curator, as I said, was uh, another artist, Jitesh Kalat, um, and his theme was world explorations. I have issues saying that word. Um, I'm not quite sure how to say it, but um, again, it draws on um, two historical episodes in Kerala between the 14th and 17th centuries and alludes um, to these kinds of links with, um, with you know, Europe and, and, and the Western world, but also um, this idea of scales of engagement. Um, and so the cosmological um, appears as something that he is interested in exploring um, as a kind of exaggerated gesture. And I think, you know, with this edition, you also begin to understand a way in which this Biennale could be seen because of its artist curators as perhaps an extension of their artistic practice. And I think that that the artistic methodologies of these specific artists comes very much into play in that. Um, and I won't really go into Sudarshan Shetty's edition, which is the most recent one, but I think anyone who looks into that and uh, will, will understand um, notions of process and theater and um, and narration that that were um, attempted in that in that exercise, um, and I just the next slide is just an image from Jitish's um, Biennale. This is Bharti Kher's work, three decimal points of a minute of a second of a degree at Pepper House, which is another water facing venue, um, and you know maps, cartography again, as I said, notions of scale, exchange, were very much at the heart of this edition as well. Um, and just to sort of start to sum up my presentation, I wanted to maybe look at two recent accounts of um, these first two editions. Actually, they don't, they don't refer to the most recent because they were published somewhat before that. But um, um, if we go to the next slide, um, in Sonal Kuller's book, Worldly Affiliations, Artistic Practice, National Identity, and Modernism in India, um, under her sort of broader understanding of the modernist project in India as one of worlding, something that we discussed yesterday. Um, and, you know, 
we see the way in which she understands this Biennale as sort of inheriting that legacy of modernism in India. Um, and here she refers in the first quote specifically to um, Sheila Gara and Christoph Stor's installation uh, that we just saw, um, where she, she kind of equates that with the kind of ghostly presence, the persistence of modernism, and, and that inciting and animating artists to this day. Um, and the second one of the idea of cosmopolitanism as a practice, um, something not to be essentialized um, or looked at as this kind of disengaged category of um, elite discourse, but one in which um, you know, th th there is a kind of commitment to a place, to a city, region, nation, and world. So again, those scales. Um, and, and in sharp contrast to that, actually, um, is this article in, in, on the next slide um, that Sandeep Lewis wrote for the Economic and Political Weekly in March 2014. Uh, which is called Disappearing Strands of Historicity, Critical Notes on the Kochi Muziris Biennale, where he um, sharply critiques this notion of um, this, this kind of almost utopian perfect space that the Biennale articulates uh, for Kochi, for um, the kind of space it's creating uh, for practice, and, um, and this, the, the loss of any kind of competing narratives or spaces outside of that for, I think he says very powerfully, um, whoever tries to create a separate space outside the conceptual premises of the Kochi Muziris Biennale can only be seen as a subject of regressive sensibilities because the Biennale is already the seat of all desired virtues like cosmopolitanism, free speech, and cultural cohabitation. Um, and I think this also poses um, a, a problem, but uh, you know something that we need to address in terms of um, how to accommodate these kinds of um, agonistic and antagonistic views, to use that kind of move and la clau terminology, um, that that actually um, open up the space, the what he calls the dialogical and dialectical relationship between artist and viewer, um, and that as a site of negotiation that does produce. Um, that does produce these antagonisms on accounts of differences of class, um, ideological differences, um, and and all kinds of other questions. And so, um, I'll I think I'll leave it at that for now because I think we've opened up some of these issues, and we'll probably come back to them in in the discussion. So, thank you. Yes, I'd like to start by thanking Diana, the Samdani Foundation, uh, for letting me talk here, and panelists, and of course, Joan for moderating. Um, the uh, title of my paper is Art as Aid. You can hear me? Yeah. Art as Aid, the Kathmandu Triennale of 2017. First slide. The Kathmandu International Art Festival was meant to have its third edition in the winter of 2015, but on April 25, the earthquake struck. Numerous aftershocks followed. Nepal, which was still recovering from its decade-long civil war, was thrown into total disarray. At least 9,000 lives were lost and 22,000 were injured. Hundreds of thousands lost their homes. Many of the, those homes are yet to be rebuilt, though it is already 2018. Many historical monuments, including UNESCO heritage sites, were nearly wiped out. The misery was compounded by India's blockade of Nepal's southern border that very year. Nepal is a landlocked country, and its supplies come through its border with India. The nearly six-month-long blockade cut off almost all supplies for the country. In such a scenario, there was little justification for a large-scale art show. The art festival was indefinitely postponed. However, Photo Circle, which is Nepal's most prominent platform for photography, decided to go ahead with organizing its first international photography festival called Photo Kathmandu. Their logic was that a photo festival could bring some hope to the streets and attempt to contribute towards rebuilding a sense of identity through the arts and culture. We knew this was an important aspect of recovery and healing." Unquote. Large bodies of work were displayed in public spaces like streets and courtyards, apart from the usual galleries and museums. They invited Philippe van Koiteren, the artistic director of the Smack Museum in Ghent, to co-curate the residencies with Nischel Oli. 
Oli, who later became the director of the Kathmandu Tree Analysis, Philippe liked Kathmandu very much, and upon learning about what was then the KIAF, the Kathmandu International Art Festival, he said he would like to be involved. That was November 2015. In March 2016, it was decided that the, that the KIAF date, to date be set for March 2017. It was rebranded as the Kathmandu Triennale in July 2016. So we have the first edition of the Kathmandu Triennale last year, but actually the, the festival, international festival, started in 2009. Though a Belgian, Van Quatren already had considerable experience of working in and with non-European cultures, as in Mexico, Chile, and Brazil. Also, he had represented Belgium in the 55th Venice Biennale and Iraq in the 56th. This meant that with his involvement, Kathmandu would finally be able to step into the global art circuit, something the country's artists had been praying for the past decade or so. Nepali artists, individually and sometimes as part of collectives and groups, have been showing intermittently in the region. In fact, we have uh, three of our artists showing here downstairs right now, and I think about five, six of them more are showing in the India Art Fair. So we do have representation, but it is, um, it's not on a large scale. Yes. And so I'm repeating, Nepali artists individually and sometimes as part of collective and groups have been showing intermittently in the region and sometimes in Europe and the US, but the big moment of discovery has been eluding them. Having Van Quatron at the helm of the Triennale, right after Nepal has been in international news because of the earthquakes, made us feel that the big moment had perhaps arrived. Moreover, SMAC Museum provided 25,000 euros in financial grants, 6,000 euros in indirect financial sponsorship, and an additional 10,000 euros through a crowdfunding campaign. Waived expenses and fees amounted to another 30,000 to 40,000 euros. Therefore, SMAC and Van Koyteren's involvement translated into nearly 100,000 dollars in contributions. The Triennale's total budget, leaving aside in-kind support, amounted to 3,000 300,000 USD. That means SMAC contributed nearly one-third of the Kathmandu Triennale's budget for 2017. When an organization calls the shots on one-third of the total budget of a program, it is expected that the program will be guided to a considerable extent by the donor organization's vision. Even more so when the organization's director was to be the chief executive of the program. In the months leading up to the Triennale, I had the distinct feeling as a practicing artist and art writer in Kathmandu that this was very much a Van Koyteren and Smack Museum initiative instead of a national event. Van Koyteren selected about 70 local and international artists who were supposedly selected through an open call. Information on the open call was not easily available and of the 20 odd artists that participated from Nepal, most belonged to an exclusive circuit that had been nurtured by the organizing gallery and foundation for years. I will let it rest here. Not that the local selection was inappropriate. Nearly everyone produced work that was well conceptualized and well executed, though spread over four major venues across the city. It was in fact these works that had the combined effect of holding the Triennale together. The local artists were allowed months to work on and fine tune their projects, and they seemed to have consciously touched upon the various cornerstones that large scale exhibitions are expect expected to deliver today. Instances of the monumental, the gender, ba gender based, the participatory, the personal archive, the community archive, the migrant labor issue based, the anthropocenic, the folk, when tradition meets modernity, the performative. The list is kind of predictable. There were barely any them thematic overlaps. In contrast, the international selections were made on the basis of the artist's capacity to develop their work, I'm quoting here, the artist's capacity to develop their work in Kathmandu within a limited time frame prior to the exhibition, which did not exceed two weeks I mean, never did. It was less than two weeks always. And also on their commitment to engage in capacity building for Nepal's art scene. It was also necessary that they have the capacity to transform almost nothing into a valid artistic proposition. Unfortunately, on quite a few occasions, the inf transformation was um, of nothing nearly ended up in nothing. No doubt this happily overturned or upturned what is usually seen when international artists descend on economically less privileged countries, but one does wish the upturning was not made so very obvious. I noticed a recurrent insularity and closedness as I wandered through the main and collateral venues stretched across the city. I soon realized that the artworks were mostly lacking conversation among themselves. We in Nepal are just getting trained in the idiom of, glo of a globalized art world and are beginning to get used to the languages of biennials and summits. But even we know that it is these interwork conversations that are, of, that are of highest interest, for it is these invisible and inaudible dialogues and contrasts when skillfully curated by a catalyzed by a curator, I mean, which we have a wonderful example of it here done by Diana, 
but for it is these invisible and inaudible dialogues and contrasts, when skillfully catalyzed by a curator, that spark of an unlearning process in the viewers and jolt us into awareness of our social and political reality. It is these conversations that set the ball in motion for eventual widespread changes in sensibility. When works are displayed so that they become objects or processes to be merely viewed or consumed in isolation, the vital justifications for a large-scale recurring exhibition disappears. I would say the overall show resembled more of a museum display and lacked the energy of a short-span art event. In, in fact, some of the collateral events or venues looked more cohesive than the main. Van Koitrona's curatorial note was very clear on its focus on the city of Kathmandu. The Triennale was called the city my studio, the city my life. The event was to be firstly, I'm quoting, an exploration of its rich cultural heritage and second, I'm quoting again, an invitation to express differences, to embrace idiosyncratic artistic practices of the highest qualities that will enter in a dialogue and generate a composition which will be a tribute to art and its vital role in society. It is interesting that when he had co-curated the track exhibition in Ghent in 2012, he had focused on the city as well. And uh, this one actually came on earlier than I had planned for. So this is what, what, what he had planned for at the, when he did the Ghent, um, Ghent show, the track. Unfortunately, the so just do take a look at it. You have been looking at it anyway. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Triennale did not allow the openness of track nor did it engage the city, city's many communities, except through educational outreach programs carried out in schools and exhibits showcased in one or two community spaces. The Kathmandu Triennale remained mostly restricted to museum and gallery venues. A couple, a couple of participatory performances did break the mold, but only as exceptions. It was mostly the art community that visited it, and here it is such a, a, such a, a good experience to see just everybody coming and, and enjoying the um, the show here, which does not happen in Kathmandu. It's more of a very restricted art community which, which attends it. The curatorial thrust also sidestepped Nepal's economic impoverishment and its po position in the hierarchy of regional politics. It concentrated on glorifying Nepal's cultural legacy instead. It was as if the political and economic constraints of the country were such a pre-given that they deserved no space for re-articulation or demanded no restructuring. This had the overall effect of removing it from any relevant regional South Asian context. Nepal was never directly colonized, but its polit politics and economy have had to respond to regional politics and economic policies for centuries. Even the crucial issue of the plight of migrant labor, which is of regional significance, was treated as a phenomenon particular only to Nepal and, that was, the, uh, and was therefore diluted. Severing its art from the regional context meant a different lens was being introduced. And this is exactly what happened. We soon realized that the event was designed as a greenhouse in which the local and international artists encountered an exotic Kathmandu where the city and its culture was discovered for international visitors and renewed for us locals. The earthquakes too were mostly kept at a distance, which is very sad because it was still our reality. I could not help but wonder that if the event had a local or regional curator, whether these issues would have been so easily sidestepped, whether there would have been more critiques on the handling of the disaster, more examination of the politics of aid, more focus on the rural countryside which has not yet recovered from the damage. I'm not advocating disaster porn. The need for positivity was understandable, and the city-based thematic no doubt made the Triennale experience more cohesive and exciting for the visiting artists, the visiting press, and the visiting critics. But it also facilitated a certain amount of exoticization and defamiliarization and othering of our own reality. Okay, we go to the slides, I think three and four, like two images, yeah. Okay. So this was, a, um, this was an installation at the opening of the Kathmandu Triennale, which was prepared by Song Dong of China. It, co I mean it, um, it cost nearly $6,000 and comprised thousands of packets of biscuits and cookies which were devoured by the public at the opening event. So it was very exciting. I mean, it took seven days to make, uh, was went, uh, went beyond the budget totally. And there was a great, um, you know, wonderful feast at the beginning. And I somehow felt that it was unethical to have to waste food on such a scale because the, um, the viewership at the, at the Triennale was definitely not in need of biscuits. But there were a lot of people out there in the country who do need biscuits. And I mean, I mean that comes in and I felt un a little uncomfortable. Nepal has, be, has also been starved of international curatorial and critical attention. The primary, that this and the, the second, the next slide, yeah. it's kind of like, that's what, that's what it looks like after it's been eaten up. Nepal has also been starved of international curatorial and critical attention. The primary thrust of the international exhibition from the very beginning was to try and place Nepali artists within international networks. Sangeeta Thapa, the founder director, has always been very vocal about this. 
I'm thinking of the Ghetto Biennale of Haiti and quoting Leah Gordon here. In Haiti, the artists wanted to find a way of having greater control of their means of distribution. And distribution in the art world is partly the ability to travel and create networks. So the first impulse for the Ghetto Biennale was to bring international artists, academics and curators to Haiti in order to build up international networks. The scenario was essentially not very different in Kathmandu either. Um, I mean, I, the, clo I mean the, no, the court closed with international networks, but um, that's exactly the same reason that we were having our international festival. With the Triennale, Kathmandu received more international coverage than any exhibition in Nepal has ever had, but it did not amount to much. The promise of visits from major international galleries and museums do, did not live up to expectations, and the hope that the local artists had had of finally breaking through the glass ceiling imposed by international and regional art world hierarchies did not quite materialize, and they were left feeling shortchanged. The Triennale ended on not April 9. Many of you will remember April 9th of last year, of course. Many of you will remember that this would be exactly a day, the day after Documenta 14 had opened it in Athens. Documenta had a Polish curator descend, descend upon Athens with his curatorial team to bring focus upon the city. And I remember one particular sentence in the curatorial note. Even though Documenta has since run into many controversies, I'm still quoting <laughs> the uh, Shimzik's um, curatorial note. Quote, quote, that unlearning everything we believe is the best beginning, unquote. There was certainly no unlearning involved in Van Koyturen's curatorial vision in Kathmandu. Which of course also reminds me of what Spivak was saying yesterday. She kept, I repeated quite a few times, white is not a color, it's a set of attitudes and behaviors. It seems the big moment has eluded us in Nepal yet again. The strap line for the inaugural Ghetto Biennale was, I'm going back to the birth Haiti because it, it, has, it resonates with me because of the earthquakes and stuff and of course the de de developing um, the attack that it has. The strap line for the in inaugural Ghetto Biennale was, what happens when first world art rubs up against third world art? Does it bleed? Coming back to the Kathmandu Triennale, in the case of the Kathmandu Triennale, there was barely any rubbing or bleeding involved. Last slide. Uh, I think you can read what's written. It's in the, the name is The Coming of the Europeans is one of the artworks by Oscar Murillo. So, um, the art, I mean, that slide actually, yeah, I think subtext to what I just said. Okay. It was more like two worlds. I'll repeat myself again, sorry. In the case of the first Kathmandu Triennale, there was barely any rubbing or bleeding involved. It was more like two worlds talking at cross purposes, one a donor and the other a pre-designated receiver or victim. So now, uh, I don't know whether it's been formally announced, but we have the, uh, we have Rias Komu, the co-founder of the Kochi Muzuris Biennale as the next um, curator for the Kathmandu Triennale in 2020. So I'm looking forward to seeing some changes and thank you. We don't have very much time, I think, um, so I uh, maybe we'll just kind of open it up to the panelists. I, I, one thing that I was wondering about if, um, since this is the first time that all of you are hearing each other talk about, you know, the biennials and biennales that you're speaking about, if there was anything that struck you in the kind of um, the, the comparisons or contrasts between them, if there was any kind of observations you'd like to share. And then after that, I think we should open it up to the floor for questions from the audience. I think the Dhaka's Biennale uh, belongs to a totally different league than all the other Biennales because uh, it is still, uh, it doesn't have a curatorial vision, it never had one and uh, people, authority involved are not really interested to insert a, a curator into this particular ecology that they thought uh, should remain uh, how it sort of be all began, like uh, it's a nondescript, um, hold, as I said, hold all, carry all uh, exhibi exhibition uh, sort of idea they had. And uh, I think it, it still continues because of the fact that uh, the older generation artists and the new generation, uh, there's this uh, huge debate between the two generations and but, but the thing is very few is uh, is, <coughs> is is actually appearing um, on on major venues like uh, we don't have any conversation between the two generations uh, what we talk about is is amongst ourselves in small groups and as uh, Kochi 
uh, uh, just referred to as, uh, as exclusive circles. So in those exclusive circles, you get to hear a lot of things, a lot of grievances are there, but to mitigate that grievance, um, uh, no one is able to, you know, sort of uh, bring these two generations or, or artists from different circles uh, to uh, ca carry on with the conversation regarding how the uh, future, um, where the future lies and how it should look like in the, in the years to come. I, uh, there's two things that stood out as, as everyone was presenting. One of the things that I really think is important in this kind of exercise as we are writing um, our criticism or history, whatever way we look at it, um, is perhaps to increasingly unpack um, the role of funding structures. And I think this might even be what, something that you were talking about right now, Mustafa, the scale of this exhibition, the kind of way it's organized and um, not in a kind of deterministic way, but really to understand the specifics. Even these these few case studies, I think, show us a great range um, in the way that these things have come together and been enabled. Um, and um, I think the other thing is the relationship to site, which seems to come up in, in many of these um, cases. And um, I think specifically in Kochi, um, I see perhaps an increasing need and and response by the the choice of curators and the curators themselves who are tasked with this to start to think about how to break away perhaps or distance themselves necessarily from having to always respond to this extremely um, you know charge site for all kinds of reasons, both the venue itself but also this kind of Im the imaginary as I called it of of Kochi Mutsiris, the title of the Biennale. And um, um, Anita Dube will be curating the next edition of the Biennale, this, which opens in December this year. And I think her connections to, as I was saying, one of the, you know, those, those kinds of artist-led initiatives, specifically in her case, the Kerala, Kerala Radicals, whom I mentioned, um, and other histories of um, that kind of practice in India will perhaps open up um, a different approach. But of course, that remains to be seen. So. Uh, just a quick thing that I think it's really important to remember how young all of these institutions are and how rapidly they respond to sort of changes or critique themselves. I think each time we go, we do see quite sort of distinct sort of shifts, even with the Dhaka Art Summit, each time we've come, it's sort of, chip, you know, turned quite quickly. And I think that's something to be uh, very conscious of. Um, and one thing that struck me in particular when we were all talking is this idea of um, audience and who are these festivals really for and the distinction really is in a way I think okay maybe again we're sort of generalizing and perhaps in some of this in some of this mapping in order to be succinct and you know do these mappings we are sort of generalizing or being a bit reductive but for the sake of it um, Gorchi really is sort of like that people's Biennale and, and it has a certain porosity to it where the Biennale itself sort of leaks over or spills over um, into the site itself, which which I feel that you know even with Dhaka Art Summit you get a number of kind of you get a really wide sort of audience. Whereas it sounds to me that the Kathmandu Triennale and certainly the Columbia Biennale has a very uh, sort of specific English speaking audience um, and mainly sort of set the same sorts of circles and hasn't really made that shift perhaps yet. And maybe it's to do with the sites, maybe it's to do with the artists, maybe it's to do with I mean a bunch of things. But that just struck me that distinction. Uh, no, um, I'm sorry, I said I will not respond, but I'm just responding to what um, Jyoti just said. Um, it's um, also, I think, um, in Kathmandu, maybe could compare to be, uh, maybe also in Colombo, uh, what's happening is we are responding more to uh, global art trends than actually developing our, going through our own processes of contemporary, arriving at contemporary art making. So it's, a po it's I think it, it happens a lot everywhere, but uh, Kathmandu, because it's been secluded for so long, um, is in the process of kind of, um, yep, uh, um, yeah, miming what's going on mostly. But there are some, one or two artists who are actually doing good work. So generally to have a triennale based on works, um, of finding 20 artists is quite difficult. 
Yeah, I think that that was one kind of interesting in um, Mustafa in your presentation, especially I think the way that you know the the biennial is a way of kind of connecting to outside trends, but then also there are, as you made very clear, risks that you know come with this kind of outside curation. In in the case of this one, or in the case of um, Asian Art Biennale, you know the way that it kind of um, the lack of curation can also have very specific results. I think so. Maybe we'll just um, take. Do we have time for a, f a couple of questions? Okay, yeah, so questions from the audience. Hi, can you hear me? All right. Mustafa, I'm Saif, uh, Saif an artist. I do free space and work in Burning Man. We do huge festivals, uh, and it's around the world, and we bring artists of different mediums in different schools together to collaborate. So there is no one type of thing that's going on. You mix it up. And like David Bowie said, if you want to do something creative, you have to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation and then just go. So have you thought about bringing these different ideas, schools, concepts, and mediums together and see what happens, because you said there is no curator. So it seems to me like an open creative process. Can, it, can that work? I, I didn't I, I'm always for heterogeneity, you know, like uh, people are creating lots of works in lots of different, using lot, lots of different stratagems, and I'm never against them, because um, I myself as an artist um, has changed over the years and um, tried out many, many different kinds of stratagems over the years. So I think what, what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to address, you know, is that uh, without a curatorial vision, you won't be able to achieve. I mean, exhibition making is part and parcel of, uh, of audience making because that's what it, that it's, it's a knowledge space. Uh, it, it has, uh, I mean, it certainly has a, a mnemonic, uh, influence on, 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 on human beings. I mean, those who go into it, the, those who look at the artworks, the way it is, uh, the exhibition is designed, it is a knowledge space. And that, the, the kind of knowledge you gather out of this particular, uh, of any kind of display, is, is, um, it sort of percolates in, into the praxis. Like, as I was saying, um, the level of praxis, like, like I was referring to the Japanese installation art that sort of inspired us, you know, the, initially we had a lot of important Japanese installation artists participating in the, uh, in the Asian Art Biennale and that sort of impacted the art scene. It left a positive impact on the art scene and uh, those who are trying to um, get out of this particular bracket, you know, like modernist, medium specific form specific art, you, they, they had this, they saw this light at the end of the tunnel and uh, they thought that they would pursue something else. They didn't copy what they saw, but they came up with their own stratagems, own ideas, ideas that, that, were, that, are, that were entrenched in their, uh, the way they, in their lived experience, you know. So I'm, I'm not against heterogeneity, I'm not against variety. I mean, there are ways to uh, do painting, there are ways to sculpt a sculpture, a piece of art, so I'm not against that. Okay, thank you. So, a oh, question from Mr. Jahangir. Uh, I'm a painter myself, and I started the Asian Art Biennale Bangladesh in 1981. And today I see the Biennales uh, as it says, large-scale rec recurring exhibitions in South Asia. That means too many biennials are going on. And uh, the other day, one artist was asking me, uh, is it Shilpakala or Jantrakala? That means, is it the fine art or the machine art? And uh, really, uh, I, I don't know what do you think of these exhibitions uh, about the installations and the video art is replacing the canvas uh, and mostly, that's why probably he said so. 
And uh, as uh, 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 the, the theme says, the large scale re recording exhibition should be. Is it good, really, or should we uh, think about something about it? Or should we all cooperate or uh, make some understandings? Uh, I was uh, told that there is a catalog of uh, biennials, uh, international biennials. And uh, I was also found out that the Asian Art Biennial Bangladesh 81 is missing from there. But uh, <clears throat> I was also wondering about uh, Sri Lanka. This is a Biennale, I, I saw 1915, 15, 16, 17 Biennales. So how do you call it Biennales? Or if it is happening every year, uh, or I misunderstood something. Thank you. I'll just respond to the last bit first, maybe. Um, no, the Columbia Biennale started in 2009, um, but the next edition couldn't happen for a few years just because of the situation, and it was so difficult. To, and also, Anushka told me that she wanted to reshape and remodel it and really gave it, give it some sustainability um, and develop this private company and, and, and get more sponsorship, which is why it took her till 2012 to mount the second edition. So there's only been four editions of the Biennale, um, and five editions of Columbuscope, which started in 2013. So the, it wasn't, it didn't start in the 50s, if, if that answers your question. Um, and just a tiny response to, do we need these? I mean, as much as I've maybe um, said the, the possibilities and the, you know, and, and also been critical of certain aspects of these festivals, I think in Sri Lanka, certainly they have been points of, um, encounters for visibility and, uh, and and brought to light certain practices that uh, theatre, for example, uh, producing brilliant performance and installation art in response to the 90s and in response to what was going on in Sri Lanka at the time. Um, but they they were their first sort of major showing was with Anushka Hempel at, in Gaul, and then as a response to that, that's what made her want to put on the Biennale. So I think um, you know the, these things have are also you know they have they have both sides okay we have to consider that uh, the other thing i wanted to know what do you think about this uh, video art and installations that's taking over the paintings particularly and uh, this large scale recruiting recurring exhibitions what are, what do you think about uh, doing what? Uh, is there any solution to stop it or enlarge it or have a cooperation or something? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So maybe Sorry, Uncle. We only have time for one more question to close the summit. So maybe if they can answer this out offline with you, I think that would be great. I just want to share the floor with a few more people, if you don't mind. Do I have your permission? So I, I don't think that it's, 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 it's for us to decide whether to stop it or continue with it. It's a question of whether uh, there are artists out there who are making art uh, uh, using different stratagems and uh, mediums. So naturally, when, when there are artworks out there, uh, they will sort of uh, come into the, the space that you construct. So what, uh, uh, just look at the Asian Art Biennale. Now it, it, it is accepting all kinds of art, like uh, it was uh, not so friendly with regards to uh, uh, cross-media explorations, cross-media pieces. But now you have video art, performance art even. Um, uh, uh, performance as a medium uh, uh, was incorporated only last year. So um, how can you not acknowledge the fact that uh, the society is changing and in sync with the um, uh, pattern of our uh, society? Uh, you need to acknowledge the fact that there will be people, there will be artists who would uh, work in a different way, look for different avenues to explore. So uh, I don't think that it is for us to decide whether to uh, um, accept them or reject them. So it's not a question of acceptance and rejection. Yeah, and maybe anymore. we can continue this, this part of the conversation after. Um, do we have uh, any last questions? 
One last question. If not, I think, yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you to the panelists for your wonderful presentations. And thank you to Diana and the, uh, all of the uh, Dhaka Art Summit team for bringing us together and for this wonderful edition. And I think um, it's a wrap.